three engines, one boiler, and a reputation so dangerous that veteran railroad crews begged to avoid it. This machine was the ultimate gamble in American locomotive history. Built at the peak of an industrial arms race, it was took by Interaiwa. It was supposed to solve the power crisis choking the nation's busiest railroads. Instead, it nearly killed the men who ran it. Why did anyone build a locomotive so brutal that it rewrote the rules of failure? And what desperation drove them to ignore every warning sign? The real story isn't just about mechanical disaster. It is about how ambition pushed railroad engineering to its breaking point. Freight trains in America did not just get longer, they got heavier and faster than anyone predicted. By 1890, railroads across the country moved about 700 million tons of freight each year. Two decades later, that number had soared to nearly 1.8 billion tons. On lines like the Erie, traffic managers watched their ledgers fill with numbers that seemed almost unreal. Every month brought new records for carloads of coal, grain, steel, and manufactured goods. The sheer volume of freight doubled, and the real work, measured in ton miles, more than tripled. This was not just a matter of more trains. The loads themselves transformed. Wooden boxcars gave way to steel hoppers and gondolas, each one heavier and tougher than the last. A single train might stretch a mile or more, snaking through mountain passes and across river valleys. On the busiest corridors, it was not unusual for dispatchers to schedule back-to-back -back consists just to keep up with demand. The Erie Railroad sat at the heart of this boom. Its tracks handled the relentless flow of coal out of Pennsylvania, grain from the Midwest, and manufactured goods bound for New York and Chicago. Every year, the company's annual reports told the same story, more cars, longer trains, and steeper grades to conquer. The numbers from the Interstate Commerce Commission and Railway Age made it clear freight traffic on trunk lines like the Erie had more than doubled between 1890 and 1910, with the actual hauling work multiplying several times over. For the men tasked with keeping trains moving, the challenge was obvious. Old locomotives strained and slipped on grades that once seemed manageable. Heavier steel cars pushed existing engines to their limits, forcing crews to double-head trains or break them into shorter sections. Sidings filled up, schedules slipped, and the cost of moving each ton climbed. Traffic managers faced a dilemma. They could add more locomotives to each train, but that meant more crews, higher payrolls, and increasing congestion on tracks already running at capacity. Or they could look for a new kind of power, something capable of moving these massive trains over steep hills without slowing to a crawl or risking a stall. The pressure to find a solution was not theoretical. It showed up in every late train, every overloaded siding, and every frustrated letter from shippers demanding faster delivery. By the early 1900s, the message was unmistakable. The status quo would not survive the freight surge. If railroads wanted to keep up with the demands of the new industrial age, they needed to rethink what a locomotive could do and how much power it could deliver on a single run. Chief engineers in the early 20th century faced an unforgiving set of physical boundaries. Every new locomotive design had to contend with the realities of steel and stone, the weight a bridge could bear, the width of a tunnel, the sharpness of a curve, Railroads were already pushing the limits. On the Erie, bridge tables dictated strict maximum axle loads, too much weight on a single wheel set, and the entire structure risked collapse. Even the most robust steel spans had their breaking points, and the cost of reinforcing every bridge along a main line would have been staggering. Tunnel clearances posed another problem. Many tunnels carved decades earlier for smaller engines left little margin for error. The cross-section of a locomotive, the so-called mechanical envelope, could only grow so large before it simply would not fit. Engineers measured every inch, knowing that a miscalculation could mean scraping the roof or sides, or worse, a complete blockage. On mountain lines, tight curves added a further constraint. 
a longer, stiffer wheelbase meant more wheels would fight against the rails, making it harder to navigate bends without derailing or damaging the track. Even a modest increase in length or rigidity could force a railroad to rebuild entire sections of its line, a project that could cost more than a fleet of new locomotives. Axel load limits were not just theoretical figures on a chart. The Interstate Commerce Commission enforced them, and insurance companies demanded compliance. A heavy locomotive might be able to pull a train up the steepest grade, but if it cracked a bridge or crushed a culvert on the way, the railroad would pay dearly. The Erie Engineering Department kept detailed bridge tables, noting the maximum allowable weight for each span. Designers could not simply bolt more steel onto an engine or build a bigger boiler without running afoul of these numbers. The temptation to build ever larger engines ran up against these hard limits. A single boiler could only be made so wide before it would scrape the tunnel walls. The firebox, prius, firebox, the heart of the steam-making process had to fit between the driving wheels. At a certain point, adding more wheels to support a heavier boiler meant making the locomotive longer and less able to handle curves. Even with the best intentions, the laws of geometry and the physics of steel set boundaries that could not be ignored. Railroads experimented with double-headed trains, two or more locomotives working together but this approach required more crews and more coordination, and it did nothing to solve the bottleneck of bridge and tunnel restrictions. The search was on for a way to deliver more power without exceeding the physical constraints of the railroad itself. Engineers began to look for solutions that would pack more tractive effort into the same footprint, distributing weight across more axles without increasing the load on any single one. These challenges opened the door to radical ideas, designs that would try to sidestep old limitations by rethinking how a locomotive could be built from the ground up. Steam, in theory, should flow like water through a wide pipe, steady, abundant, unstoppable. But on the eerie triplex, the boiler faced a demand it could never satisfy. Three sets of giant cylinders, each hungry for high-pressure steam, drew from a single boiler that was already pushed to its thermodynamic ceiling. The figures were daunting. A 200-pound-per-square-inch boiler, a firebox expanded from 90 to over 120 square feet, and six massive cylinders pulling at once. Yet the moment all three engines worked together, the pressure began to sag. The flaw ran deeper than just a question of size. Only the front engine's exhaust reached the smoke box, where it created the vacuum that pulled air through the fire and kept combustion alive. The rear engine, tucked under the tender, exhausted straight to the open air, bypassing the smoke box entirely. That meant half the spent steam never contributed to the crucial draft. With every heavy pull, the fire burned hot but starved for oxygen and the boiler's ability to generate steam lagged behind the engine's appetite. Engineers watched the pressure gauge drop from a solid 200 pounds per square inch to 160 pounds per square inch, sometimes in just a few minutes of hard work. Smokebox vacuum, the invisible force that should have driven the fire, flattened out. The pressure versus time curve for the triplex tells a clear story. As soon as the throttle opened wide for all three engines, steam demand spiked, but the boiler's supply curve plateaued. The result was a collapse. No matter how much coal the firemen shoveled, the boiler simply could not keep up. Every attempt to push the locomotive to its advertised power exposed the same reality. The design's ambition outstripped its physics. The triplex could deliver brute force for a short burst, but sustained power was impossible. The flaw was not just mechanical, it was baked into the steam circuit itself, a mismatch between the boiler's capacity and the engine's relentless demand. Three engines meant three times the moving parts, and the Erie triplex brought that reality home in the harshest way possible. Each power unit had its own full set of valve gear, rods, bearings, and linkages, 
tripling the tally of parts that needed constant oiling, adjustment, and repair. The main shop at Dunmore was already stretched thin keeping up with the regular fleet, but the triplex demanded a level of attention that bordered on obsession. Shop ledgers from the period record, terse frustrated lines, valve gear out of alignment again. Tender engine requires complete teardown. Mechanics would spend hours crawling under the boiler, checking clearances on rods that snaked from the firebox to the far end of the tender. A single bent link or worn bushing in any of the three engines could throw the entire synchronization off, setting up vibrations that traveled the length of the locomotive. Synchronizing three engines wasn't just a matter of tightening bolts. Each set of drivers had to be timed perfectly with the others, or the result was pounding, slipping, and a rhythmic hammering that left the whole machine shaking. If the rear engine under the tender slipped on wet rails, the sudden loss of traction could send shockwaves through the rods, stressing bearings and throwing the other engines out of phase. Maintenance records show repeated entries for excessive wear, eccentric strap failure, and crosshead guides scored. The complexity didn't just eat up shop time, it meant that even routine repairs became major projects. Field modifications became a way of life. Crews and shopmen tried everything from shimming bearings to adjusting valve settings by hand, sometimes just to coax the triplex through another week of helper service. But the more they tinkered, the clearer it became that every extra engine multiplied the odds of something going wrong. For shop crews, the triplex was less a marvel than a mechanical burden, one that drained resources and patience in equal measure. Shop crews and engineers quickly learned that the challenges of the triplex design didn't end at the drafting table. Out in the field, the reality of keeping these machines running demanded a constant stream of improvisation. On the Erie, mechanics spent long nights trying to coax better performance out of the firebox, experimenting with larger grates and new firing techniques, but the boiler's limits were stubborn. Memos from the Virginian shops tell a similar story, but with a twist that set their lone triplex apart. Virginian X, a number 700, entered service in 1916, carrying the hopes of its designers and the skepticism of every crew assigned to it. The most dramatic change came after months of struggle with the rear engine, which was mounted under the tender. That third set of drivers, meant to deliver unmatched pushing power, became a constant headache. Steam leaks from the tender engine's stuffing boxes filled the cab with clouds of vapor, blinding the crew. Oil and water sprayed from the moving rods, soaking the tender deck and making every inspection a hazard. Visibility for the engineer dropped so low that even routine switching became risky. In response, Virginian's mechanical department made a bold decision. They removed the tender engine entirely, converting the XA back to a more conventional articulated. Internal shop notes from the period describe how mechanics disconnected the drive rods, blanked off the steam lines, and left the rear wheels to roll freely. The third engine, once the centerpiece of the locomotive's promise, became dead weight. This field modification was not a matter of fine-tuning. It was an admission that the original concept could not be made to work safely or reliably. For the crews, these changes brought a mix of relief and frustration. The worst maintenance nightmares faded, but so did any hope of the triplex living up to its reputation. The machine that had arrived as a technological marvel left the shop floor as a cautionary tale, its most ambitious feature quietly abandoned in the name of survival. Three triplex locomotives rolled out of Baldwin's shops for the Erie Railroad between 1914 and 1916. The Virginian Railway took delivery of a single XA-class triplex in 1916. That was the entire global roster, four units built, no follow-ups, no imitators. Their working lives tell a stark story. Erie's first triplex, number 2603, entered service in 1914. It was scrapped in 1929, just 15 years later. The two sisters, delivered soon after, lasted until 1931 and 1933. The Virginians' XA fared no better. 
Delivered with high hopes, it was quietly rebuilt within a few years, its unique third engine abandoned. None of these machines reached the 30-year career that was standard for heavy road power of the era. Maintenance records from Erie and Virginian shops show a constant struggle to keep these engines running. Shop crews in Dunmore and Sayre faced a mechanical puzzle that never quite fit together. Compared to the mallets and simple articulateds, the triplexes demanded far more time under repair for every mile run. Three sets of running gear, three valve systems, and endless steam leaks from the tender engine multiplied the workload. Even in their assigned role as low-speed pushers, they proved so maintenance-intensive that their cost per ton mile outstripped any savings from their theoretical power. Railroad accountants did not need complex formulas to see the result. With short service lives, high shop time, and little operational flexibility, the triplexes became a financial liability. The experiment ended not with a spectacular failure, but with a quiet retreat. Scrap lines and balance sheets told the final verdict. The answer to the freight power problem did not come from brute force alone. While the triplex bet everything on overwhelming strength, other railroads and builders took a different path, one that would define American steam for decades. The mallet articulated locomotive, first developed in Switzerland and quickly adopted across the US, used two engines under a single boiler. Its front set of driving wheels pivoted to follow curves, while the rear set stayed fixed spreading weight without exceeding axle limits. Mallets made compounding practical, sending high-pressure steam first to one set of cylinders, then to another, squeezing out more work with less fuel. On the Erie and other major lines, these engines handled the same grades that stymied older power, but with far less mechanical drama. Railroads soon found that even mallets were not the end of the story. The 284 Berkshire, with its massive firebox and robust frame, replaced triplexes on the Erie by the late 1920s. Berkshires offered nearly the same tractive effort, but with a single set of cylinders and a layout that shops and crews understood. Their arrival made the triplexes obsolete almost overnight. No special maintenance, no exotic parts, just reliable, repeatable power. Procurement records from the Erie show a rapid shift in orders. As soon as the Berkshires proved themselves, the triplexes were sidelined and then scrapped. Industry regulators paid close attention. In 1921, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers issued a caution in their boiler code deliberations, warning against the temptation to multiply engines under a single boiler without careful study of steam supply and mechanical complexity. The triplex was fresh in their minds, a warning, not a model. As the industry moved forward, the lesson was clear. Elegance and balance, not excess, would shape the next generation of locomotive design. Today, rail technology still faces the same temptation, pushing boundaries without balancing risk and reward. As automation and AI now promise revolutionary gains, the lesson stands. Engineering hubris can cost more than it delivers. The triplex's legacy is not just in scrap metal, but in every debate over how far and how fast we should dare to go. What would you risk for the promise of power?